verse for opening a sutra. The unsurpassed profound and wonderful dharma is difficult to encounter in hundreds of millions of aeons. I now see and hear it, receive and uphold it, and I vow to fathom the Tathagata's true meaning. The Flower Dawn and Sutra, Chapter 10 Bodhisattvas Ask for Clarification At that time, Manjushri Bodhisattva asked Enlightenment Leader Bodhisattva, Disciple of the Buddha, Given that the nature and the mind are one, why then are there various distinctions perceived, such as rebirth in wholesome paths and rebirth in evil paths, perfect faculties and deficient faculties, different modes of birth, handsomeness and ugliness, and differing experiences of suffering and happiness? Why is the karma unaware of the mind and the mind unaware of karma? Why is the experience of karma unaware of retribution and the retribution unaware of the experience? Why is the mind unaware of the experience of karma and experience unaware of the mind? Why are causes unaware of conditions and conditions unaware of causes? Why is wisdom unaware of states of being? And why are states of being unaware of wisdom? Then Enlightenment leader Bodhisattva answered in verse, The humane one asks about these principles in order to awaken the Tao multitudes. I will now answer according to their nature. Would that the humane one attentively listen. All dharmas have no function, nor do they have any substance. Thus every one of them knows not all the others. As with the water in a river, which forms torrents and rapids that are mutually unaware, so too is it with all dharmas. Or as when the tremendous blaze flares into raging flames all at once, each flame is unaware of the others, so too is it with all dharmas. And as with continuous gusts of wind that buffer every object they encounter, while each gust unaware of all the others, so too is it with all dharmas. It is also like the planets of a solar system, sustained by the mutual gravitational forces, yet each unaware of the others. So too is it with all dharmas. The eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body, and the thinking mind, the sensory organs all, constantly turn and flow in samsara, yet there is no one making them turn. The Dharma nature, basically unproduced, still manifests coming into being, yet there is nothing making it manifest, nor anything that is manifested. The eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body, and the thinking mind, the sensory organs all, are empty and without a nature, but the false mind discerns them as existent. Thus in accord with principle, observe, that absolutely everything is without a nature. The Dharma eye is inconceivable, is seen without distortion. Whether we name it real or unreal, false or not false, mundane or world transcending, these are mere false words. At that time, Manjushri Bodhisattva asked wealthy leader Bodhisattva, disciples of the Buddha, all sentient beings are non-entities. And so, why does the dust come one accord with the opportunities? Why does he accord with their lives? Why does he accord with their bodies? Why does he accord with their practices? Why does he accord with their understandings? Why does he accord with their languages? Why does he accord with their fondnesses? Why does he accord with their experiences? Why does he accord with your thoughts, and why does he accord with your considerations, appearing among them in bodies like theirs, in order to teach and transform, tame and subdue them?
then wealthy leader Bodhisattva answered in verse, The bliss of still quiescence, the state of one of much learning. I, for the humane one, will now expound. Would that the humane one be attentively receptive. Observe the body in detail throughout. What of it is actually me, one who understands in this way, comprehends there is no self to be found. This body is falsely established, without a place to which it belongs. By closely examining the body, one fathoms that nothing about it can be held on to. Skillfully observe the body, clearly viewing each part, Realize all dharmas are empty illusions, and you will not give rise to mental distinctions. Who causes this life to arise, and what causes its decline and demise? Like a whirling wheel of fire, its beginning and end cannot be known. Wise ones are able to observe the impermanence of all that exists, and how all dharmas are empty, devoid of a self forever detached from all characteristics. Karma produced, the myriad retributions follow. Like a dream, none of it is true or real. Thought after thought, constant decay brings cessation, as with the previous and subsequent pattern. The dharmas perceived in this world solely rely on the mind, their host, which following its notions grubs at marks, this is inversion and not true suchness. Worldly theories and languages are all based on discriminations. Not a single phenomenon among them gains entry to the Dharma nature. The force of conditions and that which pursues them brings myriad phenomena into being. Ephemeral, they soon vanish without pausing for an instant. This continues in thought after thought. At that time, Manjushri Bodhisattva asked jeweled leader Bodhisattva, disciple of the Buddha, All sentient beings alike are composed of the four elements. They are devoid of a self or anything pertaining to a self. Why then do some undergo suffering and some enjoy bliss? Why are some respectable and others unseemly? Why are some good within? and others good without. Why do some receive little, while others receive much, sometimes receiving a direct retribution, sometimes receiving a delayed retribution, while within the Dharma realm there actually is no beauty or ugliness? Then jewel leader Bodhisattva answered in verse, According to what is done, Appropriate consequences are born. The doer is without any being. That is what all Buddhists say. As a clear bright mirror, according with what confronts it, reflects each exact image, such is the nature of karma. Or as seeds sown in a field, are mutually unaware, yet are able to simultaneously sprout, such is the nature of karma. Or as a skilled illusionist who stands at the crossroads, displaying a multitude of disguises, such is the nature of karma. As a mechanical man, which can emit many different sounds, yet possesses neither a self nor a non-self, such is the nature of karma. And as the myriad kinds of birds, although all hatch from eggs, are each endowed with distinct sound. Such is the nature of karma. Just as in the womb, all faculties are formed, yet these physical features have no source. Thus too is the nature of karma. And it follows that throughout the hells, all the various experiences suffered there are without a place of origin. And the nature of karma is also that way. Although a wheel-turning king possesses the seven splendid jewels, no source of their origin can be found. Just so is the nature of karma. And will all the worlds, consumed by a massive conflagration, 
that fire would have no source. Thus again is the nature of karma. At that time, Manjushri Bodhisattva asked virtuous leader Bodhisattva, disciple of the Buddha, all the dust come once enlightened to only one dharma. Why then do they explain innumerable dharmas? Why do they appear in innumerable Buddha lands? Why do they transform innumerable sentient beings? Why do they expound with innumerable different sounds? Why do they manifest innumerable bodies? How do they know the innumerable minds? Why do they demonstrate innumerable spiritual penetrations? How can they universally cause innumerable worlds to quake? How can they display innumerable exquisite adornments? And how can they manifest an infinite variety of states of being? While within the Dharma nature, these distinctive marks all cannot be obtained. Then virtuous leader Bodhisattva answered in verse, Disciple of the Buddha, what you ask about is profound and difficult to fathom. Wise ones are able to know and find constant joy in the Buddha's virtues. As the earth is of a single nature that allows sentient beings upon it their individuality, yet the earth has no thoughts of difference. Thus too is all Buddha's dharma. As fire is of a single nature, that enables it to consume things, yet the flames do not discriminate. Thus too is all Buddha's dharma. As the sea is of one nature, that forms myriad different waves, yet the water does not distinguish the variations, thus too is all Buddha's dharma. And as the wind is of one nature, that enables it to blow upon anything, Yet the wind makes no differentiations, thus too is all Buddha's dharma. And as huge thunderclouds universally shed rain over the earth, yet their raindrops do not discriminate, thus too is all Buddha's dharma. Or as a singular locale of earth is able to sprout all kinds of plants, yet the earth makes no differentiations, thus too is all Buddha's dharma. Also, as the sun, when not obscured by clouds, universally shines throughout the ten directions, yet the nature of its light is without differentiation, thus too is all Buddha's dharma. And as the moon in space can be seen everywhere in the world, yet the moon itself does not go to those places, thus too is all Buddha's dharma. And as the great Brahma Lord appears in response throughout the trichilocosm, yet his body is not of several different sorts, thus too is all Buddha's dharma. At that time, Manjushri Bodhisattva asked vision leader, Bodhisattva, disciple of the Buddha, given that the field of blessings of the dust come one is impartial and without disparity, how then is it that sentient beings can be seen with different rewards for having given, that is to say, their complexions, physical builds, homes, faculties, wealth, domains of rulership, retinues, offices, meritorious virtues and wisdom all differ? Given that, how can the Buddha's attitude toward them be impartial and non-differentiating? Then vision leader Bodhisattva answered in verse, Just as the great earth in its oneness correspond to each seed, nurtures a sprout, without thoughts of like or dislike, thus too is the Buddha's feel of blessings. Just as water is of a single flavor, yet differs as to the vessel which contains it, thus too is the Buddhist field of blessings. Differences are only due to beings' minds, or as a master magician is able to delight an audience, thus too does the Buddhist field of blessings inspire reverence and joy in sentient beings. As a talented and wise king 
can make the populace happy, so too can the Buddhist field of blessings make the multitudes peaceful and happy. As a clean, bright mirror reflects exact images of what appears before it, so too does the Buddhist field of blessings, according to beings' minds, effect myriad rewards. Just as the herb agada can cure one of every poison, so too the Buddhist field of blessings does relieve the distress of every affliction. Just as the sun at dawn spreads illumination throughout the world, so too the Buddhist field of blessings does dispel all darkness. Just as the clear full moon universally shed light over the vast earth, thus too the Buddhist field of blessings does extend to all places equally. Just as a Vairamba tempest can cause the entire earth to shudder, so too the Buddhist field of blessings moves the three realms sentient beings. Just as a conflagration can burn up every kind of thing, so too the Buddhist field of blessings can burn up all that which is conditioned. At that time, Manjushri Bodhisattva asked diligence leader Bodhisattva, disciple of the Buddha, given that the Buddha's teaching is one teaching, why is it that when beings see and hear it, they do not all sever the bonds of afflictions and free themselves? Why is it that although there is no distinction in their forms kandas, feelings kandas, cognitions kandas, formations kandas, and consciousness kandas throughout the desire, form, formless realms, nor in their ignorance, greed, and passion, yet some derive benefit from the Buddha's teaching, while others do not. Then diligence leader Bodhisattva answered in verse, Disciple of the Buddha, listen well, as I will now answer truthfully. Why is it some soon gain liberation, while others have trouble getting free? In seeking to expel and eliminate limitless past evil deeds, one must in the Buddha Dharma be courageous and constantly vigorous. Suppose there were only a tiny flame, wet sticks would cause it to quickly die out. Within the Dharma taught by the Buddhas, so too is it for one who is lax. Or suppose to make fire, one rubbed wood together, but stopped to rest before it was produced. The potential for fire with a stopping would die. So too is it for one who is lax. Or if one held a crystal under the sun, but failed to use tinder to catch the reflection, consequently no fire could be obtained, so too is it for one who is lax. Or suppose out in the bright sunshine, a young child shut his eyes, and then asked absurdly, why can't I see? So too is it for one who is lax. Or suppose one without hands or feet wished to use a blade of grass to pierce and break the great earth asunder, so too is it for one who is lax. Or suppose one used the tip of her hair to dip out water from the ocean, wishing to render it completely dry, so too is it for one who is lax. Or suppose the culpic fire ignited and one hoped to put it out with a little water within the Dharma taught by the Buddhas, so too is it for one who is lax. Or as when someone gazes into space and physically does not move, yet says that he can soar through the air, so too is it for one who is lax. At that time, Manjushri Bodhisattva asked Dharma leader Bodhisattva, disciple of the Buddha, as the Buddha has said, any sentient being who receives and upholds the proper Dharma can be rid of all affliction. Why then is it that some receive and uphold the proper Dharma, 
but still fail to sever themselves from them. Instead, they succumb to greed, hatred, delusion, arrogance, covering, indignation, animosity, jealousy, stinginess, deceit, and obsequiousness. Compelled by the intensity of such afflictions, they have no thought to separate from them. How is it that one can receive and uphold the Dharma, and still, within the activity of one's mind, give rise to all those afflictions? Then Dharma leader Bodhisattva answered in verse, Disciple of the Buddha, listen well to the true meaning of that which you asked, but not merely by means of much learning may one enter the dust come one's Dharma. As a person floating on water, who for fear of drowning dies of thirst, so is one who does not practice the Dharma, but only amasses much learning. As one who prepares a lavish feast, is hungry himself and yet does not eat, so is one who does not practice the Dharma, but only amasses much learning. As one who is skilled at dispensing medicine, but is unable to cure his own illness, so is one who does not practice the Dharma, but only amasses much learning. As one who counts others' riches, but himself owns not half a cent, so is one who does not practice the Dharma, but only amasses much learning. As someone born in a king's palace, nonetheless suffers from hunger and cold, so is one who does not practice the Dharma, but only amasses much learning. As a deaf musician delights others with what he cannot hear, so is one who does not practice the Dharma, but only amasses much learning. As someone blind who paints pictures cannot see what he depicts for others, so is one who does not practice the Dharma, but only amasses much learning. As a master pilot of a ship still ends up dying in the sea, so is one who does not practice the Dharma, but only amasses much learning. As someone who stands at the crossroads vastly proclaims a host of good deeds, but possesses no true virtue himself, so is one who does not practice. At that time, Manjushri Bodhisattva asked wisdom leader Bodhisattva, disciple of the Buddha, given that within the Buddha Dharma, wisdom is foremost, why then does the dust come one? For the sake of sentient beings, sometimes praise giving, sometimes praise upholding precepts, sometimes praise patience, sometimes praise vigor, sometimes praise dhyana samadhi, and sometimes praise wisdom. Why did he sometimes praise kindness, compassion, joy, and giving? And why is there never anyone who, by means of only one single dharma, gains transcendence and realizes anuttara sankhya sambodhi? Then wisdom leader Bodhisattva answered in verse, Disciple of the Buddha, how rare you are, you know what is on sentient beings' minds. As to the principle of which the humane one asks, listen well as I now explain. In ages past and times to come, as well as in the present, no guiding master speaks only a single dharma to help beings attain the way. The Buddha knows sentient beings' minds, are uniquely different in nature, based on what they need to be safe. He speaks Dharma for them accordingly. To those who are stingy, he praises giving. To those who transgress rules, he praises morality. To those with much anger, he praises tolerance. To those who like to be lazy, he praises vigor. To the scattered, he praises dhyana concentration. To the foolish, he praises wisdom. To the inhumane, he praises sympathetic kindness. To the angry and malicious, he praises great compassion. 
To the sorrowful, he praises sympathetic joy. To the crooked-minded, he praises renunciation. One should cultivate successively in this way, gradually perfecting all the Buddha's dharmas, as one first must set the foundation in order to build a palace. So too, giving and precepts are basic for all bodhisattva practices. As a city wall is built in order to protect the populace, so too do patience and vigor guard and protect all bodhisattvas. As a great and powerful king is honored by the entire country, so too samadhi and wisdom are what all bodhisattvas rely on. Just as a wheel-turning king can bestow happiness upon his subjects, so too the four unlimited aspects of mind can bring joy to all bodhisattvas. At that time, Manjushri Bodhisattva asked worthy leader Bodhisattva, disciple of the Buddha, all Buddhas will on at once were liberated by means of a single path. Why then do we perceive that the Buddha's lands and the multitudes of deeds are all different with none the same? That is to say, their worlds, the sentient beings in them, the dharma that they speak to tame and regulate beings, their lifespans, the light they emit, their spiritual powers, their assemblies, the ways in which they teach, and the durations of their dharma are all different, and yet not one has failed to perfect all of the Buddha dharma and to realize Anuttara Sankhya Sambodhi. Then worthy leader Bodhisattva answered in verse, Manjushri, the dharma is always like this. The dharma kings transcended with only one dharma. Everyone who unburdens himself can escape birth and death on this one path. Each and every Buddha's body is the one Dharma body. They are of one mind and one wisdom. Their powers and fearlessnesses are also thus. Based upon their original wish to seek body and all their dedications of merit, they attain a corresponding kind of Buddha land. With its assemblies and Dharma proclamations, the lands of all Buddhas are adorned to perfection. According to beings' different practices, their perceptions are likewise different. The Buddhist lands together with the Buddhist body, their assemblies including what they speak, as well as all Buddhist dharmas, cannot be seen by sentient beings. But once their minds are made pure and all their vows perfected, they reach complete understanding and are thereby able to see, according with what makes them happy, as well as their karmic retributions, sentient beings perceive things differently. This is due to the Buddha's awesome spiritual power. The Buddha lands are devoid of distinctions, of dislikes and of fondnesses. It is only due to the sentient beings' minds that differences are perceived. Within the mundane world, what each one perceives is different. All the dust come once. The great immortals are not to blame for this. Within each and every world, those who are ready to be transformed constantly see the hero among men. Thus is the Dharma of all Buddhas. At that time, all those bodhisattvas said to Manjushri Bodhisattva, disciple of the Buddha, we have each finished speaking about what we understand. We only hope that the humane one, using wonderful eloquence, will extensively elucidate all the states of the dust come ones. What is the state of being a Buddha-like? What are the causes of the states of a Buddha-like? What are the states of a Buddha rescuing light? What is the entry into the state of a Buddha light? What is the wisdom of the state of a Buddha like? What are the dharmas of the state of a Buddha like? What are the words of the state of a Buddha like? What is the knowledge of the states of a Buddha like? What is the realization of the state of a Buddha like? What are the manifestations of the state of a Buddha like? 
what is the vastness of the state of a Buddha like? Then Manjushri Bodhisattva answered in verse, The thus come one's profound state is equal in measure to empty space. All sentient beings enter within it, yet actually nothing is entered. The thus come one's profound state results from sublimely wonderful causes describing them ceaselessly for a million aeons would still not elucidate them all. Attuned to sentient beings' wisdom, the Buddhas induce them to advance, to gain good benefit. In that way, they rescue sentient beings, such is the state of all the Buddhas. Into every land in all the worlds, the Buddhas enter in accord with beings there, yet those beings are unable to perceive the Buddha's formless wisdom body. The Buddha's wisdom is free and at ease, unimpeded in the triple realm. This state of their wisdom is equal and impartial, just like space. The Dharma realm and the realms of sentient beings are ultimately undifferentiated and yet are fully understood Thus is the dust come one's state. All the different sounds throughout the various worlds, the Buddhas, in their wisdom, constantly discern, without making any distinctions, imperceptible to our subjective consciousness, this state cannot be cognized by the mind. It is from the clarity of the pure inherent nature that instructions to benefit beings well forth. Without karma, without afflictions, with nothing whatsoever, and no place to dwell, without reflection or any activity, they travel impartially through all worlds. The minds of all sentient beings exist throughout the three periods of time. The dust come once in a single thought, comprehends them one and all. At that time, in this Saha world, all sentient beings distinct dharmas, distinct karma, distinct worlds, distinct bodies, distinct dispositions, distinct births, distinct results from maintaining precepts, distinct results from violating precepts, and distinct results of lands were clearly manifested by the Buddha's spiritual power. Just as to the East, in hundreds of thousands of millions of nayutas of numberless, measureless, boundless, incomparable, innumerable, inestimable, inconceivable, immeasurable, ineffable worlds pervading space throughout the Dharma realm, all sentient beings' distinct dharmas, up to and including their distinct results of lands, were clearly manifested by the Buddhist spiritual power, so too was this the case in the south, west, north, the four intermediate directions, above and below.